Good morning. It's good to be with you. If it's your first time here, welcome. I'm Scotty James. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm glad you're here. I'm hoping this morning would be not entertaining. I hope it would be edifying. I hope it would be a time where whether you're in the faith or not in the faith, you might be able to take what is said from the Word of God and draw nearer to Him in some way that your adoration, your appreciation, your interest in Him would increase. That's the hope for today. So that's my hope, but you've got to do something with that, all right? I'm, I'm going to preach the Word. I'm going to let the Word do what it does. Let the Spirit do what it does. But your job is to open your heart, humble yourself, and to allow God to do what He does. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 4 to 7 today. If you're new, the verses are up on the screen. We also have a little bulletin for you. There should be a pen in the backseat pocket. I'd encourage you to take notes because you'll retain more. You might be able to re refer back to something throughout the week that might be transformative for you. So, Genesis 2, I'm going to read verses 4 to 7. It says, This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So there's, there was a wave of thought that entered into the church in the early second century called Gnosticism. Anyone ever heard of Gnosticism? Okay, so to simplify it, Gnosticism was the belief that the physical realm was evil and the spiritual realm was, was good. And so the body, because it's physical and its desires were considered evil, that's what a, a Gnostic would have thought. And so because of this, the Gnostics would deny the incarnation. They would deny that Jesus was fully human and died on the cross. They would say he only appeared to be human and only appeared to suffer on the cross because if Jesus had a body, that would make him evil. You understand how that, that wave of thought was? So Gnostics thought the body was evil. Now there's a new wave of thought that has entered into the church, very common, similar to Gnosticism, but not exactly the same. It's not that the body is bad, but this wave of thinking that, is that the body is, is unimportant. And so you'll, you'll see or hear things along the lines of, all that matters is what goes on in my heart, or all that matters is my soul, and how I treat my body, how I relate to my body, what I do with my body is not of that great significance because this body is just going to die and it's just going to decay anyway. Very common line of thinking in the church, especially I think among those who have maybe been in the faith for quite some time. And that mindset, though it's not identical to Gnosticism, it certainly resembles it in that it misunderstands and mis it confuses the, the significance and the purpose of the body. These bodies are not insignificant, unimportant matters of, of, of flesh. The human body is actually central to God's plan of revelation. When you consider the Bible, let's do a quick Bible survey. Okay, let's, let's look at all the major episodes in the Bible and how God is revealing himself to humanity through those episodes. If you want to keep up, write down creation. Creation, Genesis 2, verse 7. Creation, which we just read, God creates mankind, and he creates mankind by forming a what? By forming a physical body and then breathing life into that body. And then you have the fall. Write down the fall. Genesis 3, verse 7. The fall is when mankind falls from grace they sin, they disobey God, and fracture their relationship with him, and how do they do it? By taking with their physical body and eating. It was a physical act that broke mankind's relationship with God. Then you have the curse. Write down the curse, Genesis 3, 19. God curses, pronounces judgment on mankind, and many things are cursed, but specifically the human body is cursed. God says, from dust you are, and to dust you will return. These physical bodies will now die because of our sin. Then you go to the New Testament, you have right down the incarnation. Incarnation, John chapter 1, verse 14, if you want to write that down. John 1, 14, 
This is when Jesus became flesh. He came down from heaven and put on human physical form and lived a sinless life. Then you have the crucifixion. Crucifixion, you can write down Luke 22, verse 19. When Jesus was physically nailed to a cross and physically died on the cross. Then three days later, you have what? The resurrection. The resurrection, when Jesus physically, Luke 24, 6, Luke, uh, Jesus physically rose from the dead. Then he walked the earth for 40 days, and then 40 days later, he ascended, the ascension, he ascended into heaven, which means he physically levitated and rose into heaven while his disciples watched him. And then one day, the Bible says that he will physically return to the earth, and then when he returns, we're going to experience our resurrection, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When we, these physical bodies who are that have put on decay, will somehow be resurrected and put on immortality and will dwell in those physical bodies for all of eternity. So all of the major episodes in God's revelation of mankind, creation, the fall, the curse, incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, return, glorification, every one of those episodes the human body is central to. And you think these bodies are insignificant and unimportant. You thought wrong. <laughs> the human body is not insignificant. It actually is what makes you human. For the past two months, we've been going through the series on what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to live fully in our humanity? And we've seen a lot of things. We've talked about our connection to God. We've talked about our connection to each other. We've talked about our relationship to our emotions. And today we see that to be human is to have a body. Our human bodies are central to our experience of our humanity. And God has given us human bodies for a lot of reasons, but one of the primary reasons he's given us these bodies is for revelation. God reveals himself to us through the body, and God also reveals things about ourselves through the body. We're going to take a couple weeks to go through this, but today I want to look specifically about what the human body reveals about God, and then we'll get into a little bit about what it reveals about ourselves. So if you're a note taker, Three things I want you to see that the human body reveals about God. First one is, the human body reveals God's glory. The human body reveals God's glory. Write down or go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19 and verses 1 to 4. Psalm 19, verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voices go out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. Interesting. Interesting. So the psalmist says that the heavens and the skies proclaim the glory of God. To, to, to declare or proclaim is to announce. It's to express. It's to, to explain. But the Bible also says that they're declaring this without a voice. They're declaring God's glory, but they're not using any words. Interesting. And so what the psalmist is pointing to is the spiritual truth that the glory of a creation points to the glory of its creator. That's what the psalmist is unpacking for us. The glory of a creation reveals the glory of its creator. The glory of creation points to the greater glory of God because God created it. God has made a lot of amazing things, but the most incredible, um, intricate, complex, brilliant, sophisticated, detailed, awe-inspiring, astounding creation that God has done is the human body. And it's not even close. There is nothing as, as diverse and filled with the potential for creativity and filled with the capacity for, for intelligence and productivity than the human body. And when you understand the human body, and how mind-blowing even the simplest of 
functions are, it, it, it's, it, it will lead you to, it should lead you to worship. For example, right now you're listening to me for the most part. Most of you are listening. Some of you are zoning out. All good. For those who are listening, what's happening is that sound waves are traveling through this room and they're banging into your outer ear called the pina. And your outer ear is funneling or channeling those sound waves into the middle of your ear. In the middle of your ear, there's these tiny bones, three types, called ossicles. And these ossicles are receiving these vibrations and they're pushing them even further into your inner ear. It gets to this chamber now called the cochlea and inside your inner ear, there's these tiny hairs inside your ear that are receiving these vibrations. And those tiny hairs push them deeper into the ear and they connect with the auditory nerve. Your auditory nerve now triggers your brain and sends it to its temporal lobe where your brain makes sense of everything you're hearing. And all this is happening at the fraction of a second without you even knowing it. And God did that in less than a day, by the way, in less than a day. I'll give you one more example of how ridiculous even the most basic of functions are. Right now you're looking at me and a miracle is happening. Light is bouncing off of me and it's going into your eye, the outer layer of your eye, which is called the cornea. So it goes into the cornea and the cornea bends the light. It bends it and sends it through to the next layer of your eye called the aqueous humor. So a watery substance, watery layer of your eye. From the aqueous humor, it goes to the next layer, which is your iris. Your iris is the color of your eyes. So if you have blue eyes, green eyes, that, that circular color is your iris. And in the middle of the iris is the pupil. Your pupil automatically expands and gets smaller because your iris has tiny little muscles that make it move. And those muscles are, are, are automatic. Now, the light goes into your pupil, and from the pupil, it goes back to the, to, 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 to the next layer of your eye, which I want to say is called the... Um, oh, it goes to a lens behind your pupil. And that lens bends the light a second time so that you can make sure you're, you're getting a clear image. Then from that lens, it goes to the back of your eye called the retina. Connected to your retina are photoreceptors. Are you, are you still with me, Kana? There's photoreceptors. There's these tiny little nerves. They're shaped like cones and rods. There's over 100 million of these nerves in your eye. And these little photoreceptors take the light and they transfer the light into these little electric impulses. And they send these electric impulses to your optic nerve, which goes to your brain, which makes sense of it all. And all of that is happening at the fraction of a second without you even trying or you even knowing it. Now, what's the point of giving an a anatomy lesson? I want you to see that the human body is to the glory of God. You can't study the human body and not realize how incredible God is. You can't. And I don't mean this disrespectfully. If you are not in the faith, all good, but just, just hear my heart. You can't study the human body and think that an intelligent creator was not behind it. It's irrational, illogical, nonsensical to think that anything other than an intelligent creator made these bodies. You can debate about who that creator is, what he's like, fine. But you can't come to the conclusion that this just accidentally happened. And the ears and the eyes aren't even the most complex part of the body. Your brain is, is ridiculous. And so what I want us to see is that the, the, the human body is to the, the glory of God. The human body screams about how magnificent and intelligent and awesome the God who made it is. The human body is to the glory of God. Second thing I want you to see that the human body reveals. The human body reveals the goodness of God. Write that down. The human body reveals, it proclaims the goodness of God. You write down Psalm 119. Sorry, Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is what? He is good. His love endures forever. We looked at this a few weeks ago. Goodness is one of God's foundational attributes. It's God's essence. So it describes who God is and how God is. And so God is good 
And he has revealed his goodness to us through our bodies. Our bodies are the vehicle through which we understand God's goodness. They are the, the channel. Our bodies help us to interpret what it means that God is good. And so if God wasn't good, if it weren't for our bodies, we wouldn't understand what it means that God is good. Okay, life, God has implanted life with all kinds of goodness. And that goodness points to God. For example, any of you guys struggle to wake up in the morning? Okay, it's hard getting out of bed. You know you have things to do, but you double down on sleep. You hit the snooze button. Why won't you get out of bed? Any thoughts? You could say laziness. You could say what? The reason you don't get out of bed is because of the goodness. Right? There's, there's goodness in your bed. There's, there's goodness in those sheets that's keeping you in that bed. And then you get out of bed finally, and you get your morning coffee. Can't start the day without my morning coffee. Any of you guys out there? I'm not a coffee guy. Pastor Matt, Matt drinks enough coffee for both of us. So Matt can't start his day without his coffee. So when you go into the office, you'll see Matt most mornings with his coffee, and he just has it in his hands. He's not even drinking it. He's just holding it and just, just smiling. <laughs> Just holding it, as if by holding this cup, the warmth that's going into his hands, he just knows this is going to be a good day. No matter what comes his way, he can overcome, because this coffee will somehow make it overcome. So when he holds that cup, or when you hold your morning cup, what's happening is there's, there's warmth, there's, there's goodness in the form of warmth that's coming out of that cup, and it's being received through your hands. Your body is interpreting, it's understanding the goodness. God put that in there. God formed it that way. And so God's goodness is seen in the goodness that that coffee has, and it's, again, interpreted and understood through your physical body. God has given us bodies that allow us to interpret his goodness more than any other creature. Dogs can understand God's goodness. When they eat a meal, there's, there's goodness in there, but dogs can't hold a cup of coffee. Dogs can't appreciate the beauty of a sunset. God, uh, d- dogs can't, can't appreciate the vastness of the stars. Like God has given us the capacity to understand and receive his goodness more than any other creature on this earth. It's interesting. But what about the brokenness of our bodies? Like, yeah, when you can see, that points forward to the glory of God. But what about when you can't see? What if you're blind? Or, or what if you're deaf? Or what if you're born without a limb? Or what if your, your brain isn't functioning to the degree that it could? Or what if you have a, a disease? Like, how does that point us to God and make us draw near to him? It's a fair question. I can only share my personal experience. Let me give you a quick recap of who Jesus is in case you don't know. It's a man named Jesus in the Bible who is fully God and fully human. The Bible says he's the eternal son of God who came down from heaven and became a human. Then he was born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, then he voluntarily dies on the cross to pay for the sins of mankind, rises from the dead three days later, then he ascends into heaven where he's seated at the right hand of God until the time comes for him one day to return to earth and judge the living and the dead. So the Bible said that Jesus is in heaven, but one day, like I said earlier, he's going to return. And when he returns, he promises to make all things new. So this earth, Jesus promises, he's going to make it whole again. And the animals and the creatures and the weather patterns, he's going to make whole again. And these physical bodies with all their brokenness and their disease and their dysfunction, Jesus promises he's going to make it whole again. So for me, when I see the brokenness of the body or even experience the brokenness of the body, For me personally, it makes me yearn for Jesus' return. It makes me realize this is not how it's supposed to be, but thanks be to God, it's not always going to be like this. Jesus, he promised he's coming back. He's 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 going to heal this. So when I see brokenness, it makes me say, Maranatha, oh, come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. It makes me want to hasten the Lord's return. 
And so even the brokenness of the body and, and the dysfunction of the body can lead us to reverent worship and cause us to draw near to God. The human body reveals God's goodness. Write down Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. Genesis 1, verse 11. It reads, then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. Here's the next one. The human body reveals God's personhood. These bodies reveal God's personhood. So when God made the living creatures, he gave all of them the capacity to multiply. And so, and the capacity to multiply according to their kind. They don't just multiply, they multiply according to their kind. So oranges, God has implanted seed that produces future orange trees. Orange trees can't make apple trees. If apple trees don't make lemon trees, they must multiply according to their kind. Same thing with animals. Dogs multiply according to their kind. Dogs make dogs. Dogs don't make lions. Lions don't make cats, or lions don't make elephants, right? <laughs> lions are cats, you, you know. <laughs> we multiply according to our kind. When it comes to humanity, to a degree, Kinda, we are God's offspring. We're not God's species, we're not equal to God, but we were made like God. We were made in his image, we're his, his image bearers. And God reveals himself and his personhood specifically through our bodies. Now, God is spirit, so God doesn't have limbs. So we don't reflect God when it comes to, we don't reflect God in his form or in his shape, but we reflect God in his personhood. A person is a being that has a will and emotions and a mind. And so a human is a person, but not every person is a, a human. You understand the difference? Right? God is, is, is a person. He didn't have a body, but he's still a person. He has, he has a will. He has a mind. He has emotions. And we come to understand what God is like through our bodies. For example, our emotions. Like we have emotions because... God has emotion. God feels. The Bible says God feels sadness. He feels lament. He feels joy. He feels anger. He feels frustration. And our bodies allow us to in part understand what that is and feel somewhat of what God feels. When you're happy, your body triggers a hormone called cortisone that gives you that pleasure feeling. And when you experience that pleasure feeling, to a degree you're understanding what God feels in part. And when you're sad, your body triggers hormones that cause you to feel down and, and lament. And to a degree, you're participating in the personhood or experiencing, to some degree, the personhood of God. And so these, these physical bodies allow us to, again, better understand and better relate to, if you would, who God is in his, in his personhood. Next one. This is the final one, and this, this starts to move into us. There's so much more that the body reveals about God, but now we'll start moving into what it reveals about us. If you want to write it down, this next one, the human body reveals our dependence on God. The human body reveals our dependence on God. Write down Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Matthew 6, 25. It'll be up on the screen as well. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food, or the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Skip ahead to verse 31. He goes on to say, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? 
or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. As incredible and complex the human body is, it's ironic how fragile the human body is. The human body will cease to exist very easily. It, it, it can't survive on its own. And so even though we have the capacity to build cities and communities, if you took food away, we would die in a month, maybe two. And we can create airplanes that can fly across the, sky, the, 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 the earth, but if you took water away, we would die within days. It's crazy. We can put men on the moon, but if you remove oxygen, we're gone in minutes. And so the human body, really the human body with all its dependence, it shows how utterly dependent on God we are. Even as amazing we are, we are so, so dependent on God. It's ridiculous. Every morning, I believe, when you get out of bed, if you're over 30, when you get out of bed <laughs> and you go to the bathroom, there's this pink elephant in every one of your bathrooms, and you pretend like it's not there, and you act like he ain't sitting there, but he is, every single one of us. You know what that pink elephant is? It's your mortality. It's the fact that you are going to die. If you are over 30 years old, when you look in the mirror, you are beginning to see signs of aging. Maybe it's a gray hair. So what do you do? You, you pluck it out. <laughs> or you dye it. Or maybe it's receding hair. And so you shave it. <laughs> or maybe it's wrinkles. And so you put on some foundation or some concealer, ladies. You're aging. And aging is your body's way of telling you that you are dying. No matter how organic you eat, no matter how much you work out, no matter how much you pay for cosmetic whatever, you are on a runaway train towards eternity. <laughs> and you can't stop it. This is the truth. In fact, write down, John, uh, write down Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. Genesis 3, 19. This is the curse. By the sweat of your brow you will eat food until you return to the ground. Since from it you are taken, for dust you are, and to the dust you will return. This is the truth that the human body communicates every day to us. From dust you are, and to the dust you will return. Aging is a reminder to all of us. The body is communicating to all of us that we are spiritually sick and in need of a physician. And Jesus is that physician. You need a physician, and Jesus is that physician. Every day, your body is saying, listen, you need Jesus. You need a savior. You need a healer. That gray hair is the body's way of telling you, you need Jesus. That wrinkle is the body's way of telling you, you need Jesus. Turkey arm, or whatever you call it. <laughs> Cankles. It's your body's way of telling you, listen. You think I'm joking. <laughs> you need Jesus. It's what the, bo the, the body is communicating to us. Write down John. I don't know if we'll be on the screen, but write down John 11, verse 25. I don't think it's on the screen. John 11, 25. I'll just recite it. Jesus says to Mary or Martha, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Then he asked her, do you believe this? So he's saying, I'm paraphrasing, this physical body is going to die, but your soul can live on through faith in me. You are sick, and I can heal you. You need a savior, and I am that savior. I want to cleanse you of your sin in this life and heal you of your sin in this life and give you life everlasting, and that life can start today. Do you believe this? 
the body is communicating to us through aging that we are desperately in need of a savior. And Jesus is that savior. The body's speaking all the time. Are you, are you listening? Are you listening? Imagine if we were listening. We'd be transformed. Imagine if moving forward, the simplest of functions that you do, instead of just taking it for granted, but you started to realize, wow, me picking up this pen, there was something unbelievable about my brain triggering my hand. Trigger wow, praise God for that. Not that you have to get on your knees and worship him in that way, but just even the thought that, wow, that was a miracle. Praise God for that. Imagine when you hold your coffee, it becomes more than just holding your coffee, but you realize, wow, there's goodness in this cup. And that goodness points to God's goodness. It's God is good because he, he made this, and I'm interpreting his goodness through my, through my hands. Wow. Praise God. Imagine when you woke up, and before you get yourself ready, put your makeup on and comb your hair, you realize, wow, I'm, I'm aging. I need a savior. Jesus is that savior. Thank you, Jesus. Like, what would happen if we started to listen to what God is telling us through our body? We would start to fix our eyes on Christ all throughout the day. We would start to live lives of worship. We would start to live lives of worship where in all things, at all times, thank you, Jesus. In all things, in all circumstances, at all times, all throughout the day, we are fixing our eyes, putting our attention and our affection and our appreciation back on him, even if it's for just a fraction of a second. Now we're starting to live lives of worship. And this is the level of transformation we're trying to go for in this church. It's more than just behavior modification and get you to put some money in a basket. We want you to be worshipers who see God in all and through all and at all times. And the body is communicating us, if you listen, and respond, you might start moving toward more of a life of worship. So I would encourage you as we close, ask God to make you more aware of what he is saying through your body. That God would make you more aware of his glory through your body. That God would make you more aware of his goodness through your body. And that God would make you more aware of your dependence on him through your body. And as you hear these things, may you lovingly, humbly respond to these things that you might fix your eyes on him and set your attention on him more and more throughout the day and show greater appreciation and worship for him. The body is speaking. Let's be people who listen and respond and worship. Amen? Amen. 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 And you thought the body was just this insignificant piece of decay. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, so often we want to hear you speak. If only God would speak, if he would just tell me. And yet the reality is you are speaking all of the time. Make us better listeners. Make us better listeners. Thank you for these bodies and how they reveal your glory. Make us more aware of that that we might respond in worship. Thank you for these bodies and how they reveal your goodness. Please make us more aware of that and respond in worship. Thank you for these bodies and how they reveal our dependence on you. Please make us more aware and let us respond in worship. Please use these bodies to transform us and make us into worshipers of you. We trust you for these things. Everybody said together. Amen. Amen. So I'll stand and give God some praise before we close.